Hello everyone, um, my name is Henry, um, this is my first video, I hope you enjoy it if you're interested in history, medieval history, um, the end of the world, anything like that. Um, now because this is my first video I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing but I thought I would um, give a brief overview of the end of the world or how medieval citizens saw the end of the world um, through medieval maps, which I think is really interesting. Um, and if you're not interested, you don't have to watch it, but you could, you know, learn something new, um, find out something you didn't know before, or just watch for whatever reason you have. You know, I don't really mind, um, but I'm going to be looking at three different maps that were made in the 13th century. One of them was made in 1200, or around about 1200. One of them was made about 1265, and one of them was made about 1290. They were all made in England, uh, and I'm going to tell you why they're so interesting. Um, so the end of the world was a big thing, uh, as it is now, I suppose, but back then it was more embedded into culture, embedded into European religious life. Um, and maps were one of the ways that people explored that idea, explored the idea of the apocalypse. Um, so I'm going to show you these three maps and what they've got in common, why they're so interesting, and hopefully uh, some of you will be interested. So I'm going to have a look at Beasts, monsters, horrifying creatures. There are a lot of them. No one really knows entirely whether people believed in all of them. Um, we're pretty sure they believed in some of them, but not all of them. Um, and I'm going to tell you why they're there, why they're in the position that they are on these different maps, um, and what that meant for the geography of the medieval world. Um, we're going to look at some fire, depictions of fire. Lakes of fire was a big thing. People liked lakes of fire. Well, not like them, but it was interesting. Um, we're going to be looking at different buildings, um, cities, Jerusalem being the main one. Um, I'll tell you why that's why Jerusalem was so interesting on medieval maps. Uh, so these are the three maps I'm going to be looking at. Kind of cutting off the bottom right one, I'll tell you, there we go. Um, so the one on the left is the Sawley Abbey World Map, which is made in around about 1200. Uh, the middle one, the Salter World Map, which is very small, uh, which was the one made around 1265. And then the last one, which is arguably one of the most famous medieval maps in the world, which is called the Hereford Map of Mundi, which is the one that was made around 1290, so at the end of the 13th century. Um, and I'm going to tell you the similarities these three maps have and the differences and why I think they're so interesting. First of all, though, let's go over some of the features that medieval maps had that the vast majority of them shared. Um, so Jerusalem, very important place, um, biblically and geographically. Uh, obviously, the Crusades were predominantly faced with reclaiming Jerusalem, reclaiming the Holy Land. Um, and I can do a different video about the Crusades and interesting things to do with that if people would like. Um, but I've got a couple of quotes here from, well, from the Bible. Uh, one's from the book of Ezekiel um, 5.5, 5, and it's, Thus saith the Lord, this is Jerusalem, I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries round about her. We're essentially, all you need to know about that is that it means that biblically Jerusalem was at the centre of the world um, and at the centre of the universe, I suppose, because the world was at the centre of the universe. Jerusalem was at the centre of the world. Um, so it's a very important place, really important for medieval Christians and for everyone, I suppose. But I'm going to be looking at Christianity mainly. Um, and then the book of Revelation, which is the end of the Bible details the events of the apocalypse um, 
Revelation 21.10 says that Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God um, after the apocalypse. At the end, um, Jerusalem survives. Jerusalem is the new world, essentially. Um, and the depiction of Jerusalem doesn't change massively from map to map, but sometimes its location does, which is very interesting. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I'm um, going to be looking at monsters. And this is, so the, this isn't completely to do with monsters, but it is kind of. Um, essentially, before medieval maps, um, the vast majority of world maps were TO maps. So it looked like a T um, and the O went around it. So the O was the world, like the globe, and the T was the separation of continents. Um, so you've got Asia, Europe, and Africa, <laughs> obviously. Those are the only three continents. Why do you need anything else? Um, and the inhabitants of each continent were believed to be the descendants of Noah's sons. Sem, Japheth, and Cham. There you go. Um, Sem in Asia, Japheth in Europe, and Cham in Africa. Uh, and the important thing about this is that in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, obviously, um, Noah cursed the descendants of Cham to be, um, quote, a servant of servants, which is from Genesis 9.25. Um, and he blessed the descendants of Sem and Japheth. 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 Can't say that. So, um, because of this, a lot of people believed that the descendants of Cham in Africa were cursed. Uh, and the vast majority of monsters and mythical creatures are found in Africa. And that might be why. Um, I'm not saying that with any certainty, but it's an interesting theory. Um, next up we have, well, OK, let's dive into the map. So this is the Sawley Abbey world map, which was the one made in 1200. Uh, it's the oldest existing English map of Mundi. And it displays a really, really beautiful uh, coloured version of a Christian world, kind of awaiting the Day of Judgment and the Apocalypse. Um, as you can see, and I'll zoom in in a minute, uh, there are four angels that kind of guard the world um, at each corner. Um, they are holding back destructive winds, uh, which are the winds of the apocalypse, which I'll show you on the Hereford map of Monday. They're there as well. Um, and the angel in the top left, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but I'll zoom in, is pointing at the world. It's the only angel that's pointing at the world. And it's pointing at a section of the world where Gog and Magog live. Now, you might be asking, who are Gog and Magog? Um, they were mythical figures, biblical figures, um, that in the book of Revelation say will be kind of let loose on the world during the apocalypse. Um, and so the presence of Gog and Magog on a medieval map is very apocalyptic. Um, they are the figures that will roam the earth during the apocalypse. And the angel pointing towards Gog and Magog, no one's entirely sure what it means, but it could be showing um, God, angels, the church's role in the apocalypse. Um, and I did think about going into the different kinds of apocalypse in this video and the different beliefs people had about um, the role of the church, the role of God, the role of the Bible in the apocalypse. But I thought that it's a little bit too much to put into one video. Um, and that's why I wanted to focus on maps. But if anyone does want to know more about that, I'm sure I could do a video on it. It is very interesting. Um, so written in this little walled off section is a Latin phrase, Gog et Magog, gens immunda, which roughly translates to Gog and Magog, the unclean people. Um, and they are present on all three of the maps that I'm going to be showing you. Um, some of them have more detailed descriptions. This one's very basic. It's just one sentence, uh, but that's because the map isn't enormous. Um, but it is a very interesting map. I 
And then we go on to the Salter world map, which is the one created in 1265. So middle of the 13th century, 65 years after the Sauli one. Um, we once again have Gog and Magog in the top left. Um, they have a much more detailed description in here and the walls look a lot better. But I mean, the main thing about this map is how amazing it looks. I mean, that looks beautiful. Um, the colors are fantastic. The detail is amazing. Um, and one thing you'll notice is that it is entirely circular, unlike the Sawley one, which we just saw, and the Hereford one, which we'll see in a minute. Um, well, the Hereford one is circular, actually. But anyway, this map is amazing. Uh, the reason it is so circular, hello. Um, well, one of the reasons it's so circular is because of the theory of concentric circles, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but you can see Jerusalem right in the middle, it's that orange dot, uh, right in the middle of the map, kind of looking like a bullseye, um, right in the middle of the world. And what you've got around here, around the southern edge, um, which is to the right, um, did I mention that? No, I don't think I did. Medieval maps never pointed north, they pointed east. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we have the word orient and oriented um, orientation as because maps used to point east, never north. It's very interesting. Um, so this southern edge of the map, a lot of monsters on it. Uh, I've got a really interesting quote about the different kinds of monsters there. Um, they include Men with four eyes, six fingers, humans without tongues, ears or noses, a flat-footed skiopod and a headless blemmy with eyes and mouth pressed into his chest. So a blemmy is a kind of, it does, he doesn't have a head. It's just his torso and that's where his eyes, nose and mouth are. Um, monstrous essentially. Troglodytes, cannibals and the dog-faced cynocephalus. Cynocephalus. Anyway, all that means is that there are a lot of monsters around here um, and they're on the southern edge of the map. So if it was a TO map, um, they would be, as they are here, in the African continent. Um, and these are the 12 faces of the apocalyptic winds, destructive winds of the apocalypse that will blow across the earth when the end of the world comes. Um, and on to the last map I'm going to talk about, which is the Hereford map of Mundi, which, as I said, was, is probably one of the most famous medieval maps in the world. Um, and it's beautiful. Also, it's huge. Um, I don't know if anyone watching this has ever been to Hereford Cathedral, but you can see it. And it is enormous. It takes up an entire wall. Um, and it's very, very, very detailed. It's very interesting. Um, one of the more interesting things about it is that the border is so detailed. Um, the border shows the entire story of the Last Judgment. So up at the top, Christ sits in judgment, sorting the, uh, the damned from the saved, uh, going to heaven or to hell. Um, and the, the damned, when he's judging people and if he's damned, you can see demons dragging people into hell. Is really really cool. Um, you've got Gog and Magog once again um, and at the bottom I've got it written here that unlike the Salter map monsters are all over it. Now it might be because the people who created this map wanted to include lots of monsters, lots of mythical figures, lots of um, horrific beings um, and so they simply couldn't just have them all the way around the outside. They needed more space so they put them they kind of populated them around the entire map as well um, but regardless the concentration of monsters and mythical creatures are mainly around the outside not only around the outside like the salter one but mainly and it's i mean it's fantastic it's beautiful um, down in the bottom left corner there's a very interesting kind of classical inspiration um, where you can see Augustus Caesar. 
a little bit weird, but he's in the process of dispatching people, three different people, to go and measure and map the world. Uh, and above his head is a line of Latin, which I can word up. Translated, it reads, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. And if you recognize that from primary school or whatever, don't be surprised. Um, it kind of echoes the New Testament, where the New Testament says, and it came to pass that in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled, which is from the book of Luke uh, 2.1. Um, and that's a very famous phrase for use in kind of primary school um, Advent plays and, you know, the nativity and stuff. Um, but in this context, on this map, it changes the meaning to suggest that Augustus wanted the world to be mapped and known rather than for people to be enrolled, you know, to go back to their hometown to sign up like a census, um, which is very interesting. And no one's entirely sure why it's there, but it's pretty cool. Go on to, here we go, the concentric circles idea. Um, so mainly with medieval maps, middle of the map, very important, holy, outside of the map, unholy, monstrous. Um, and that could be just because, and this is a massive generalization, do not take my word on this, I say this entirely from my own brain. Um, your ordinary medieval citizen, 13th century, would not have visited very far away places. I mean, if you went, um, if you were a soldier, you went to battle, you'd go abroad, if you wanted a crusade, obviously, that's a very important way of going. A lot of people went on pilgrimages. Um, so you could go to uh, Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, you'd go all the way down to Spain, Santiago de Compostela from um, Northern Europe. Lots of people would have moved abroad, gone traveling, but a lot of people wouldn't. And even those people that did go traveling might not have gone as far uh, abroad as people do today. Which is one of the reasons why the outside of the world is seen as so alien to people, seen as so monstrous. Um, and these concentric circles that kind of in the center of the world, Jerusalem, really holy. And as you work your way out, it becomes less holy, more monstrous. Um, and it might just be because people rarely visited places really far away. So no one really knew what was going on there and people relied on, well, on maps for one, on poetry, on songs, on uh, fictional literature. Well, I say fictional literature, literature that was advertised as non-fictional, but in today's world, definitely fictional. Um, that would be distributed. Um, and that was all people knew about it. If, if, if you didn't visit the African continent, there's no way of knowing about it apart from what other people tell you. And if you believe everything that people tell you, you're gonna end up with a pretty warped worldview. Um, yeah, well, I think I think that's everything. This is, this is a very basic slapdash tour of medieval maps and their apocalyptic imagery. Um, and also it's very narrow and focused on these three maps from 13th century England. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do want anything else, um, by all means, make requests. I mainly focus on medieval stuff, but I can have a look at other things. Um, whatever you want to. I'll research it, read it, try and make it uh, accessible. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new. And if you did, please let me know. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, and this is my first video. So if you if you do want to see more, um, then please do subscribe. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, I completely forgot to say I'm going to put a long list of sources in the description. Um, so it's going to have the uh, all of the secondary sources that I consulted and read uh, for this video. Um, and you, I mean, you don't have to look at them if you don't want to, but if you are interested in it, 
or if you want to know where I got some of my information from, I'll include that um, in the description. I'll copy and paste my bibliography into it. Um, and again, thank you very much for watching. Thanks.